Welcome to another episode of Mindful Musicians with Nancy Schleyer. Today we have Zachary Wiggins, also known as Dr. Zach. He is a singer and a pianist from New Orleans. So welcome to the podcast. (laughs) First off, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into music, what kind of music you perform, all that kind of stuff. I grew up as a kid taking piano lessons doing the method books, playing Disney songs and that kind of stuff. It started pretty young and kept going with that, just doing my weekly piano lessons and playing in talent shows and that kind of stuff. I did some, a variety of different things for music growing up, but probably the biggest shift for me was when I got to middle school and high school. I was playing saxophone for a little bit and I was into jazz and when I got into the high school jazz band, there was like 12 kids who wanted to play the saxophone. Nobody played the piano. And yeah. so that was kind of an opportunity for me to step over and play the piano in the band rather than compete with the else on the saxophone. So I, I did that and I started taking some piano lessons with a, a jazz pianist in Portland, Oregon, by the name of Randy Porter. He's a terrific player and he kind of helped get me started on a lot of things. And you know, did that for a while and uh, went to college and had to get a real job phase of thinking I should go be a dentist or, you know, some other kind of thing and it wasn't working out for me. So I, you know, decided to go back and, and study music. I was always just really into learning about how music works, how it's put together and improving my skills, my abilities, you know, learning how all the different parts and instruments could work together in a band or, or learning about arranging music and writing my own music or recording, all that kind of stuff. It was just it was fun. It was interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and I, I was also, you know, just motivated in school and people kept, <laughs> well, I kept running into opportunities where people would give me some kind of scholarship or reason to be in school. So I just kept going. I did a, an undergraduate in jazz studies at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And then I went down to Arizona, Tempe, Arizona, and did a master's in jazz piano there. Oh, wow. And then I did a PhD in music history and musicology at Arizona State University as well. That's... And... Wow, that's super cool, randomly. Sorry, keep yeah, going. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, so um, I was working down there, finishing up my dissertation, and I was writing about teaching New Orleans-style traditional jazz in the university system and how a university teacher or a college teacher might codify a tradition. It's like a living and breathing complex style of music. And how do you define what that is or present it to a classroom in a textbook version for students? You know, embrace your role as as an authority figure in sculpting the next generation of musicians. Um, So that was, in a nutshell, my topic. And I finished that degree and graduated in the throes of the pandemic. And Mm. my plans of becoming a university professor kind of had a wrench thrown in there because all of the the job searches were getting canceled and everything. Mm -hmm. In a life crisis reevaluation moment, I decided to move out to New Orleans and start meeting different musicians. And people were playing porch concerts and outdoor type events, brought streaming their shows out for everybody. And I had a little bit of money because I'd got a, a dissertation fellowship so I could survive off of that for a while. So I moved out here and took that opportunity to get to know people and fortunately ran into some steady gigs playing in the, in the French Quarter. So I, I play mostly on Bourbon Street, which is a wild party street. I play three days a week or three nights a week with a guy who does a bunch of old jazz songs and he does like a Frank Sinatra impersonator, King Cole, Tony Bennett impersonation type of deal. All the good jazz that people come and they want to hear what a wonderful world and fly me to the moon and stuff that people recognize. So we do that and then 
I just mean on Bourbon Street, it's a melting pot of music. People want to hear some rhythm and blues, or they want to hear some Johnny Cash, or just whatever thing that they're calling out that they'll put money in the tip jar for that we think we can pull off. <laughs> this a so cool. little bit of my journey. I took some jazz piano in college, and I thought, because I was like, I'm a classical musician. I've been taking piano for, I think at the time, like 15 years. I was like, Psh, jazz piano, it's not going to be too bad. And I got in there and the guy was in his like 50s or 60s and he had been playing jazz as long as, long as he could remember. And he would just be like, yeah, cool. None of that applies to jazz. And I felt like I was learning a new instrument. Cause it was so theory heavy. He was like, yeah, you have to know about seventh chords. So I'm this dumb 19 year old kid being thrown into it. And it was insanely organized, but yet fluid. Like you were talking about, it's like this living thing. What is it about music that drew you, that kind of pulled you in? I think on a real basic level it's when i was a kid that's what people praised me for and i'm like yeah. play some song and, and i would get attention and they would clap their hands and say oh you're so special you're great we love listening to you play on some level it forms your psychology i still even though i recognize that today it's if i don't practice the piano regularly i can feel something psychologically in my mind a little bit deprived oh people aren't giving me my attention i don't know if you could go deep on a rabbit hole about that but to me i just enjoy there's so much to learn about it you can learn more about chords and harmony and how things fit together in interesting combinations or try different rhythm you know what happens if i have multiple keyboards in a band an organ player and a electric pianist, two guitar players, a drum set player, and a percussionist. How do you create something together and not step on each other? Or if you get into recording, there's all kinds of little details about making each instrument speak in the mix and yeah. really grab a listener and keep their attention and make people want to dance. Or how do you make something sound good on a really nice set of speakers and how do you make it also sound good in somebody's tin can speakers in their car or something or their smartphone speaker you know, there's so much so many aspects to it and i just think it's cool being able to create something that people like that people enjoy that's entertaining um, yeah that's and like awesome. when you think about the cost benefit analysis of it how much money you can spend buying a digital piano and buying some books and learning stuff on YouTube or taking some private lessons. You can get years of enjoyment out of that versus somebody who's going skiing and buying all this skiing equipment and driving up to the mountains. It's like you can burn all kinds of money doing that. I don't know. I guess. So the show is Mindful Musicians. For me, I know like when I get really into practicing or really into performing, it's almost like the whole world melts away and it's just me and the instrument. I had a, a gig a while back at where I was performing as a backup pianist in a church band for a little non-denominational Christian church in the South. But it was really cool because in the middle of their services, it would just be like, it was almost like the congregation would disappear and it was just me. But I'm just wondering what your experience with performing. I think for me being in school for a long time and have in a school situation, it's like you, you rehearse with your ensemble for weeks or months to yeah. prepare this polished performance. And then you get up in front of people and there's a lot of pressure when people are sitting there very quietly in a dark room looking at you on stage. That's a very different type of environment than what I do most days here. And I also had a lot of experience. I was living out in Arizona and most of the gigs that I would play out there would be at some big business convention and hear the background music while they're having the banquet and the cocktail hour and that kind of thing. Yeah. And people aren't really paying attention. And in that thing, it was, this is, we're going to play music. We're going to make it nice to listen to. 
but it's more about sort of the relationship with the other musicians. Who do I want to hang out with and play music with for an hour or two and get a hundred dollars or whatever. And in New Orleans, people come out here and they are wandering the French Quarter, taking it all in, drinking and partying and just relaxing, looking for some entertainment. Sometimes they're sitting there quietly paying attention, watching you, enjoying it. And sometimes maybe they're just doing their own thing, talking to their people. Or... It can be all kinds of variety of stuff, all kinds of different situations. Yeah. And I guess for me, probably the biggest thing is I feel like the more that I think about what I'm doing, mm -hmm. the game is always to get out of my own head. If I'm in my head, I'm thinking about, well, what's this song, or what key am I in, or how does this melody go, and maybe I should try to play it like this, or maybe I should try to work in this cool lick I've been working on, or I wonder if I try this weird, this different thing that I don't normally do, how would that go on? There's all this stuff going on in my head, and for me, it's always a big challenge and a goal to just get out of that. Sometimes I just try to play, and I just take the risk of just stop thinking about what song am I even playing or what's the next chord, what tempo are we playing or what's going on or even looking at my hands and just looking around the room, smiling at people, dancing with the music and just yeah. see what comes out of my hands. Let it be more of like a subconscious kind of thing. And that takes a lot of work, I think, to be able to get to that level where you trust yourself to do that and feel like it's something that people are enjoying. But I, I think that the artists and the type of music that I enjoy most, I, I feel like that's the space that people get into because they're not really thinking about what they're doing. Yeah. You know, I can see what you're saying about like the audience kind of melting away and you're kind of in your own flow. I guess what comes to mind is if you've seen that movie, John Batiste, it's like a Pixar movie. Oh, uh, soul? Soul, yeah. It's a soul thing. He's playing the piano and everything fades away and he's in his own little artistic world. But he's like, whoa, where did you go? <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Sure, that, that happens. So. It is a balance, like you're saying, because you don't want to completely drift off because then you're like, wait, where am I? What's going on? At the same time, I don't know. I find that my music always sounds the best when I'm enjoying it. Does that, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> How do you manage that free thought almost? How do you merge those two things? I, I think it's a constant negotiation based on the situation that you're in. For example, let's say somebody comes in and they request a song that I'm only like vaguely, mm -hmm. or maybe I've never heard it before, but the singer knows how it goes and I'm just going to kind of follow that. And okay. We're going to hope that we land in the same place. So maybe I've got like a chord chart and we figured out what key is going to work, and we're just going to give it a shot. In that situation, I'm using a lot of my focus to think about, like, how does their phrasing match up with the chords that I've got here? Or if I've been able to listen to the song and I know how it goes, how am I just going to follow them? Because maybe they're not going to do it exactly like the recording I heard, or maybe there's some kind of complex instrumental moment that somebody's going to skip. Oh, that bar is gone. We're just not doing that one. In that situation, my focus is really on who is leading the band and how can I accompany them and support them and make sure that I'm playing the right chords. Sometimes, maybe I'm trying to connect with the audience, and so I'm trying to let go of my focus on the music and on the band and just try to connect with the people. You know, or other times maybe. My hands just aren't feeling that great, and I don't really like the sound that I'm getting. So I'm really like trying to be conscious of the touch that I'm getting on the key and mm -hmm. trying to like dial that in to a place where I feel comfortable. I guess that's my answer. It's, just, it's like a constant negotiation of things. See, what's my priority right now? What does the music need? What do I need? What does the gig need? How can I focus my attention or let go of? my neurosis or whatever and just try to relax. So how would you take that and let's say you're talking to a, a student or a younger musician and they ask you that. They're like, how do you know 
what the music needs. What kind of would you give somebody? I would say you know, try to develop your intuition. I'm still learning. I'm learning every day that I go to work do and every time I work with somebody new, it's kind of new experience. How does this person do this? Or how can I fit into this situation? I do my best. And if you're in school or you've got a private teacher, try to do try to listen to what they're telling you to do and do the best you can. If somebody is giving you explicit guidance, if they say, hey, go practice this, then go practice that. You know? But if you're in a situation where you're performing or you're working by yourself or you just you practice what you needed to practice, if you're trying out something new or you're specifically trying to just get into new musical situations, maybe start a band with some friends. Try to write some of your own music or... Try to learn some type of music that you haven't learned before or, or get yourself into a new performing situation if you've never accompanied a choir before. Or I think every new musical situation you get into kind of helps you develop your intuition and think about what what's going to work best in that situation. And you just get stronger at, at that. As well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's that is such great advice for any musician, whatever their level is, expand your repertoire, expand what you're doing, expand your experiences. I, going back to that, 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 that church that I was accompanying their church band, like I had performed in groups before I had performed with like other pianists. I'd done a lot of work with like vocalists and things like that, but I hadn't done a whole bunch of work with, with chord sheets and with like in a, a band setting at, like that. And it was really interesting. The first couple times I was terrible. <laughs> and I'm glad that they kept calling me back and being like, hey, are you busy this day? Are you busy this day? Because I learned so, so much. I learned so much about like arranging. I learned so much about chords, about how to transition between chords easily, come up with different little licks kind of on the fly to make each chorus sound bigger and sound better and sound more because there's only so much you can only add so many instruments and then that's all the instruments that there are on the stage and then you have to be able to come up with something new so whether that was adding an octave or arpeggiating something or and it was always interesting to see because because you know you have the music director and he would be like okay guys this needs to be bigger and like that <laughs> could mean a million different things, just depending. And so it was always interesting to see how I was able to adjust and adapt to that. And it definitely informed my playing after that. So what drew you to jazz? I know you mentioned that in middle school and high school, you were in a jazz band. What drew you to that? Was it just that it was available? Probably when I was younger, I started playing a little bit of ragtime piano. I just had a piano teacher who said, here, why don't you try some songs out of this ragtime blues type book. And I learned a couple of those things and I thought it was fun. People seemed to like it. And my dad was actually into like smooth jazz and smooth sax. And that, that style of jazz is not really kind of like, oh, you're in smooth jazz. Like, what? People are like, a little bit judgy about smooth jazz, yeah. But there's some, there's a lot of amazing musicians who play smooth jazz. They yeah. make a lot of money. Yeah. Are you being so judgy? Okay, mm -hmm. that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, that's how I got into it. probably playing ragtime and listening to my dad's smooth jazz. Yeah. And then once I started taking some saxophone lessons and taking some jazz piano lessons, that opened me up to a lot of different styles of jazz and. I was playing all kinds of music. I was playing church music and classical music, and you know, I started a band with some friends in high school. That we would just be like rock, funk, station, jam band type stuff, and we thought we were cool. It, a lot of the jazz knowledge augmented what I was doing with my friends there. Yeah, um, yeah. I think if you were to go back to that time period, a lot of colleges didn't really have like popular music studies programs at that time and so it was just expected if you want to do anything that's not classical music or that's popular music adjacent 
then you should go study jazz and learn about chords and improvisation and that will just open you up to being able to do whatever. Nowadays, you can go to Berkeley College of Music and you can only focus, you can become this really amazing, popular musician just on playing rock and pop and you know, producing records, like stuff that you hear on the radio, and not really be all that involved with jazz, I think, so you're kind of a little bit of that. Yeah. But that's probably how I got into it, ragtime and smooth. Ragtime and smooth jazz. Those are some great influences to have. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Just, yeah, I don't think there's a musician alive that doesn't know at least a little bit of ragtime, especially piano pianists. Everybody knows the entertainer. <laughs> Even uh, if they don't know that they know the entertainer, they know the entertainer. Here's the funny part, too, is I've gotten to the place where it's a couple months ago, I thought, I'm just going to learn, like, the whole Maple Leaf rag, like how it's written out. Because, it's, yeah, I could play that. People would be into that. Yeah. And if you actually sit down and take time to learn that stuff, there's all these different people who have different perspectives on how it should be played. There's this whole sort of, like, niche subculture of like people who are like really amazing at ragtime piano mm -hmm. there's this guy i think his name is tom Breyer. like you can look him up on youtube and see him play like maple leaf rag in four different keys or something wow. and it's, it's just like amazing and i guess these people have like festivals and stuff and, but seeing like how can i do this and make it entertaining and how can i or, or like you mentioned the entertainer you can play the entertainer and there's like a whole like like minor strain at the end that nobody ever plays because it's not in any of the simplified piano or anything. And I was like, wait, there's this other part to this song that doesn't even exist. Yeah. Talking about the maple leaf rap, I'd heard the beginning the a the hundred times. And then I think five or maybe five or six years ago, I had a student who was like, I want to learn this. So I was like, oh, cool. So yeah, we'll learn it. So I pulled up the sheet music and it's intense. Like it's got octaves all over it, has a key change. We have this whole like crazy section. And there's and the level of like mastery and the level of thought that went into these pieces is just it's crazy. It's like I think so many people discount like pop or rock or even to an extent, I think jazz. Obviously, there are so many people that are like, oh, classical is the best or whatever, but there is a level of thought and preparation and intentionality that goes into these that is mind-blowing and there's I remember in college I was taking a music history class and it was impressionism to, to like modern music and my teacher had a whole like section on <laughs> like Janis Joplin and <laughs> people like that Joni Mitchell she like had this whole like spiel about like Joni Mitchell and she wrote this whole like album and she's saying if you listen to the album it's all these classical musicians and she like put a lot of thought in all this it's easy to discount those things and to say oh they're not as worthy or whatever and i think i had a professor in college who he called that ivory tower thinking these, these musicians live in this ivory tower and they don't come down to the real world and it's i don't know I, what are your th <laughs> what are your thoughts on that i guess i i just went on a spiel well, uh just in, in regards to that, I thought a lot about that when I did my musicology degree. Music history people, that's one of the favorite music history discussions because you take a music history course in college and how many important artists and recordings can you fit into one semester? Mm -hmm. How much material can you shove down the students' throats and tell them it's the most important thing ever? Yeah. And in reality, it's just, there's so much music. There's no way that you can cover every single thing that's important. There's no way that you can be comprehensive. And even if you try to be comprehensive, that's only just one perspective on it. A lot of music history teachers who were pushing the boundaries would just say, okay, we're, we're going to be, we're going to try to balance like what the expected can have canonical works are. We're not just going to completely throw out Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Yeah. Uh, or Beethoven symphonies, or whatever. But we're also going to try to come in and, and talk about more marginalized composers and genres and see how there's some merit and some a lot of depth and interesting stuff going on there. Like for me, I, I was in jazz school, I got really deep into jazz. And when I 
got into music history, it just broadened my mindset a lot. I found, oh, there's a lot of other stuff I enjoy listening to. There's, I don't have to only listen to Miles Davis and John Coltrane and Chick Corea and jazz greats. That's just a couple people's favorite people that got written into the textbook. There's so much other material out there, and you can listen to whatever you want to listen to, and you can enjoy whatever you want to listen to. Yeah. Um, so there's that. The one other thing that I'll throw in here at the end, just because you, when you initially mentioned the whole podcast of mindful musicians, one thing that has really influenced me lately, I read this book called Radical Honesty, called Brad uh, by Brad, and he's he's a very colorful type of guy, like a psychotherapist hippie, and. I won't say everything he says is, is 100% gospel, like, or that I agree with everything that he says, but I found it to be a very mind-broadening concept. And all, the whole basis is just that everybody in their lives and their interactions with other people <clears throat> lies about stuff. We're constantly shaping our own narrative and filtering our words and our presentation to other people because we want to appear cool or we want to get a certain reaction. But when you get down to it, having real, honest, intimate communication with another person, the basic thing of radical honesty is that they focus on what kind of sensations are you feeling in your body, right? You know, or what are you noticing about yourself? Oh, I'm noticing that I'm throat's dry because I've been talking a lot on the podcast or I'm noticing that I'm trying to look like I know what I'm talking about because somebody might watch this and judge me. I'm noticing that hey, I've done a lot of interesting things. I hope people enjoy this or get something out of it. Or I, I want them to think of me as somebody that's cool and, and professional and is making interesting work and enjoying my music or any number of things. Yeah. But those type of things, what are you feeling in your body? What is like literally objectively happening around you right now? My wife just texted me. She probably yeah. needs something. I need to go do that. You know? <laughs> or, you know, I'm in my thoughts and seeing what are the thoughts that I'm having. And those things have been really influential to me lately, just thinking about playing music. As yeah. I'm performing, like noticing, oh, I'm really nervous right now. Like I had a friend visiting and came to a gig the other day and I played one set and then I told him afterwards, I said, yeah, I realized that I'm, I'm much more self-conscious because you're here hanging out, listening to me. So on this next one, I, I'm going to, I'm just going to try to stop caring a little bit you know, yeah. and see how things come out differently. Yeah. I found that to be a really interesting sort of mind broadening concept. Radical. Yeah. I like that. I think that's really great advice for musicians in general is just to notice what's going on and what thoughts you're having. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that so much. I I like wrote it down. I'm going to go look that up. That sounds amazing. That sounds really good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to chat with you, Nancy. It's great chatting with you. Good luck to everybody who might be listening. If y'all, if anybody you or anybody would like to connect with me you can have a website.com or i have a youtube channel also the same thing there's some content on there right now i'm trying to eventually get into putting more out there and yeah absolutely definitely things. yeah so, if anybody is, is interested in that check it out go check his stuff out awesome i'm definitely going to go check your youtube channel out and your website. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye.